Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the Ordinance and Rules Committee meeting of March 27th to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence for all those who serve our country here and abroad. Thank you. Please be seated. Clerk Semino, roll call. Councilor Ringus is presently not here. Councilor Hume? Here. Councilor Flaherty? Here. Councilor Morin? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ringus, who is the Chairman of Ordinance and Rules, will be here shortly. He is stuck in Boston traffic. We're going to go ahead and uh, when he gets here, he can take the chair. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 27th, 2024? So moved. Second. There's been a motion made by Council Moore and seconded by Council Flaherty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Old business, there is none. New business, we're moving to order 24009. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of Boston petition for zoning map amendments. 338 Elm Street, map 20, 2071, plot 5, and 0 Elm Street, also known as 7 Hawthorne Road, map 2065-34, or take up any action relative thereto. Uh, we're going to begin with a presentation. We're going to hear from Director Santucci Rossi first. Then there'll be a presentation, and we're going to allow public comment. This is not a public hearing tonight, so we'll allow anybody who's here in attendance uh, after the petitioner and Director Suntucci Rossi has spoke. There is a sign up at the door. If you'd wish to speak, please sign up there. So at this time, I'll call Director Santucci Rossi up to Uh, good evening, uh, members of the Ordinance and Rules Committee, and I appreciate you uh, taking me first this evening uh, based on a prior commitment I have uh, in another community. Um, but I'm here this evening to provide um, the Planning Board report. Uh, this was prepared on March 21st and circulated um, to the members and to the council members uh, through Sue. So the Planning Board, um, under the Massachusetts General Laws, um, 40A section 5 is required to hold a public hearing on all petitions for text and map amendments. Uh, this is a map amendment petition uh, submitted by the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Boston. Uh, the planning board held a public hearing on March 12th. We noticed that properly um, to the abutters to abutters within 300 feet and also in the newspaper um, as required under the law. Um, the planning board report has some basic information about the application as stated by uh, Council Hume this evening, including the location of the property. It's important to note that 338 Elm Street is 11.1 .1 acres and then 0 Elm Street or 7 Hawthorne, which is the church proper, uh, is 0.759. So we're talking about approximately 12 acres of land here. Uh, the current zoning of that land um, and a lot of the land in that neighborhood as shown in the maps that are provided in the report is residence B. Uh, the petitioner is here this evening seeking to rezone that to uh, residence C. There's been some questions I think it might be important to add and I've looked at these in detail uh, that have come up um, from the uh, neighborhood and I've also had some emails from residents of the community um, and uh, again, detail in, in more detail in the report, uh, is this a, a spot zoning uh, is one of the questions that I have been um, confronted with. And um, as noted in the, in the staff report, um, I'm not looking at this as a lot. I'm looking at this as a tract of land. When we look at the size of this and we look at the neighborhood and we look at the lots in the neighborhood, I would not distinguish the rezoning of this tract similar to the rezoning of a single 9,000 square foot piece of, of land that, that exists on an existing street. So uh, as the uh, planning professional here in the community, I do not have any concerns um, about spot zoning. Uh, another important correlation to make when we look at these areas and we look at the maps, 
directly diagonal from the intersection is residence, B, residence C zoned property. Uh, so it's important to note that when we look at many intersections uh, with South Braintree Square, we can look at North Braintree, we can look at Liberty Grove, that you often have uh, general business or multifamily districts at those intersections and then you work your way back into the uh, residence B and sometimes in some cases uh, residence A sections. So we had a full, a full night at the planning board and we had a lot of folks come and speak. I see a lot of them here this evening. A couple of people spoke in favor, uh, but a majority of the people that spoke that evening um, spoke against it. To summarize, um, the spot zone came up, concerns about um, what does the developer want to do with the property and concerns about, you know, reassurances about that. And I've, I'll make it clear this evening, as I have in every other rezone that we have done here in the community, uh, there is no requirement to show a concept plan and there is no requirement for uh, the town um, to bind uh, the developer in doing any of the things that he's talked about. So he'll, he's going to talk about those a little bit later this evening. Um, but a situation where we're going to rezone this property for A, B, and C is, is frankly just not an option uh, for the council, and that is not, not anything I would advise them to do. Once the property is rezoned, the developer can use it for anything that he uh, would like that is allowed either by right or by special permit in that, in that zoning district. Uh, so a majority, I'm not going to go over all of the neighborhood comments. Most of those people are here this evening. I'm sure everyone's read through the report. Um, but a decent amount, pages and pages, and I want to thank our recording uh, secretary, Louise Quinlan, for getting this together in short order so that the council would have this document uh, when they start to deliberate this matter. The planning board members themselves um, talked a little bit about some concerns, but ultimately the recommendation uh, was 3-2 favorable in support of, of the rezone. And that concludes my presentation. I'm trying to keep it brief. I know that the neighbors want to speak, uh, but I can answer any questions that the counselors may have this evening, uh, and I will be available till 5.30 in case something else comes up before I need to uh, get on my way. Sure. Thank you, Director. Any questions from the committee for Director Santucci Razi? No? Yep. Council Flaherty. So, one of the things that has been raised often with regard to this pr proposed zoning change is the extent of traffic that different zones generally produce. So generally, is there, is there a known quantifiable difference between the volume of traffic produced by a property of this size that's developed uh, with housing according to the parameters set by Res B versus what could be produced if it was zoned as Res C? So looking at the difference between uh, single family homes and semi-detached single family homes, that's essentially what we're, what we're talking about here. So um, I have not looked at that in detail, um, specifically making a comparison. Um, I did look at the ITE, and ITE is getting very broad in their residential categories. Uh, and looked at that for a townhouse. And the townhouse unit, per individual unit, would produce less daily trips uh, and peak hour trips than a single family home would. Uh, just understanding the size of it, number of bedrooms, sort of the composition of the household. Um, but I have not dived deep into the traffic things. The, regardless of the zoning district in the proposal, um, our traffic bylaw article 14 will be applicable. And at the time in which they pursue something um, at the planning board, we would be looking at the traffic and just like any other project would be doing uh, mitigation as warranted. I can tell you that, you know, residential uses in general, uh, despite multiple voices about traffic, traffic, traffic. They're not producing the volumes um, that any type of retail office or any of those uses um, would actually produce. Some of our larger multifamily complexes, this is just based on monitoring, they're producing about a third of the number of units in the peak hour. So if there's 100 units, we're looking at 33 trips. If there's 50 units, we're looking at, at 15 to 20 trips. And that's consistent with uh, some of the monitoring and some of the more recent traffic studies uh, that we are currently reviewing uh, right now. Uh, one of them is on, on Hancock Street. 
Okay, and then also as a, a comparison between res C and uh, res B, how much control, when you compare those two kinds of zoning, how much control does the town have, is the town able to exert over the kinds of development that can happen in res B versus the kinds of development that can happen in res C? So um, under the residence B scenario, uh, definitive subdivision, um, which would mean, you know, permitting infrastructure and permitting lots. People often con confuse the construction of the homes with the definitive subdivision, and that's actually not what the planning board is approving when they do it. They're approving the lots and the infrastructure. Um, that would be by right. They would obviously need to meet the subdivision control uh, requirements, um, and that's done under, uh, not, not under 40A, but under Chapter 41, which is our subdivision control sections. Um, also allowed in the uh, residence B, and we have an, a perfect example of that, is uh, congregate living is our definition. More popular uh, modern term is assisted living, and we have one of those at Sunrise. That was built in a residence B zoning district. So that is an example of something that could be built by special permit. Uh, with a special permit comes a, a different level of criteria and bar. Uh, and then any of the exempt uses, um, religious institutions, which we have here, uh, daycare, schools, uh, those, those uses would be uh, exempt and be allowed under the uh, so-called Dover Amendment, um, under 40A, Section 3. So I keep referring to 40A. Those sections are all the sections that dictate um, sort of the governing of, of zoning and how, how we operate. Um, under the residence C, residence C is our multifamily district, quote, unquote. We have very little residence C property in this town um, and very, very few lots uh, in res C that actually meet any of the kinds of requirements that are in the zoning bylaw, talking about 100 feet of frontage and having a minimum of, of one acre. Um, this particular lot would meet those things. Um, in the residence C, I think important to note, people think C, they think big. Same height as residence B, 35 feet and three stories. Residence C has much greater setbacks than residence B. So whether people are in tune with that or not, there are some benefits to the residence C. Greater setbacks, same exact height. Um, the, the use of the land as residency, and I apologize, I didn't bring the use table this evening. Um, off the top of my head, those congregate uses are also allowed by special permit. And the main difference, and I think what, what is the crux of a lot of the concerns is multifamily is allowed by right in that zoning district. And it's based on the density calculations laid out in uh, zoning ordinance in section 135.705. So a little bit of a distinction. Um, obviously, different zoning districts have uh, different allowed uses. Uh, I'd be happy to elaborate um, on that if there's some future follow-up, if there's some uh, additional detail. I just didn't, I don't have all of the uses um, memorized off the top of my head. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Moran, are you good? I'm just gonna ask one, one question. Uh, this is something that you had, I, I watched the planning board hearing. I, I, I um, am aware of y your comments and, and your report for that, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, my question's a little bit off the beaten path. If uh, the town wanted to use community preservation funds to partner with or work with this developer to reduce the number of lots, would, uh, if it, were, it would have to be for affordable housing, and it would be an allowed use of community preservation funds, correct? To reduce the number of lots in a definitive subdivision? To, to partner with the developer for the development of affordable housing, which may have the overall result of reducing the number of lots. Um, we can use community preservation funds to, um, maybe it wouldn't be a partnership, but the developer could seek those funds um, to provide additional affordable units above and beyond our, our pending uh, ordinance. But that is, yes, that is something that could be done. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, thank you Director Santucci Rossi. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to thank you. Mr. Clemens or Mr. Modestino or both of you.
Good evening, uh, Michael Modestino representing the developer, George Clements of Clements Investments. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, I wanted to point out some things. Uh, my client, my client is actually the archdiocese on this matter. I had them sign the petition and uh, they are requesting the rezoning. And the, and the request is based upon uh, the best use of this property. Uh, the property is a fairly substantial area. It's almost 12 acres of land. We don't have a lot of opportunities like that in the town of Braintree to, to do something positive with that property. Uh, my client's idea for the property is to build uh, townhomes in, in single family over 55 uh, construction. It would consist of, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, I had the number somewhere, it's uh, 15, 15 single family units. It's, it's on the uh, chart here. And it would also consist of 10 duplexes, which obviously would be 20 units. And it would also consist of 13 townhomes that would be back up in the, in the corner area near where the church is presently standing. So a, a total of 48 units. The current zoning in question under residence B would allow for the construction of up to possibly 26 homes and other uses of the property would be allowed under the so-called uh, Dover Amendment. Uh, the homes, if constructed, would consist of homes of four or five bedrooms, two or three bathrooms, two car garage parking, and each would contain approximately 3,000 square feet of livable space. A rezoning of the property from uh, B to C would permit the opportunity to allow substantial land preservation as per my client's plan. Not all the plan area would be used for housing. Uh, we would, would like to uh, dedicate five acres of the property at the uh, upper end of the property for conservation purposes and, and have that property deeded over to the town. A rezoning uh, of the subject property would permit an opportunity to create diverse housing that the town is much in need of. You know, I've lived in the town all my life. Uh, I know that we need over 55 housing. We don't have any right now. I'm not really sure why that's happened and it's in other towns and municipalities, they have over 55 housing. It would be a good thing for the town. I think this would be a good spot for that type of uh, housing, and my client is committed to that. Uh, a rezoning would substantially reduce land clearing and would protect the existing tree canopy as well as reduce the overall asphalt roadways and light uh, pollution, if any. Uh, rezoning would allow the town of Branchy to work with the landowners to provide the town with significant traffic calming mitigation uh, my client would work very hard to come up with a flexible design to make that work. And, and I, I've listened to the residents over the uh, past number of months. I share their concerns. Um, they're all good people. They all have good intent. And, and I've listened to what their concerns are. There's also a good number of people that have come forward that are in favor of this project. Uh, many people have approached us directly or indirectly and, and told us exactly that. Uh, with a rezoning, there'd be an opportunity to increase tax revenues for the town. There's no tax revenue coming out of this property at all, and it would generate a substantial amount of tax revenue. Uh, ultimately, this land is going to be developed in some manner. It's not going to stay as it is. Uh, there's an old school in the property that's falling apart. Uh, there's a church that we really don't know what's going to happen with it. We are before the uh, historical commission to help decide what to do with that property. My client has not closed the door to preserving the church if it can be done reasonably. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, there's been a lot of controversy about this matter, and, and I hope that that gets better as time goes on. Uh, my client and I looked, we're not CPAs, we're not financial experts, but we looked at the numbers and we determined as best we could that at $9.48, uh, cents per thousand on the taxes uh, if we built houses on that property and the houses are 1.5 million to 1.7 million uh, you're talking about a $16,000 tax bill you know coming into the town being paid to the town also if you build houses you're likely to get families which which are good obviously and with children and you might have as many as three children in the home uh, it is we looked at some statistics. Uh, 
at the average rate per student of $16,008.72. Uh, with three students in the household, that would come out to $48,026.16. If you subtract the money generated from the tax revenue for these properties, uh, you'd be at a deficit of about $830,000 uh, for the town. Uh, and the added cost to that would be road management, utilities, plowing, sweeping, uh, and, and probably be a sizable cost to the town with that type of project if, if the property remained uh, residence B. Whereas if condominium units were built, 48 units were built, uh, townhomes were built, we're looking at maybe you know eight to nine hundred thousand dollars per per unit. Uh, we're looking at revenue per unit of approximately eight thousand five hundred and thirty-two dollars per per residence. Uh, that totals out at four hundred and nine thousand five hundred and thirty-six dollars in tax revenue to the town. And if there's no children in the schools, then there's not going to be any deduction made from that. So it, it would be a win from the town for the town, I believe. And I would ask uh, the council to strongly consider that. Uh, Mr. Clements obviously has other possible uses of the property, uh, assisted living, you know, possible uh, schools, uh, daycare facilities, that he doesn't need the, the permitting that he would need to have otherwise. And he has considered those as well. He's had offers from some of these individuals, but his goal is to build the uh, over 55 housing. He thinks it's definitely needed. He thinks it would be a, a great winner for the town. Now, I'm gonna have Mr. Clements come up here and, and uh, describe in more detail some things about the uh, proposed plan. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your time this evening. Uh, just to kind of reiterate some of the points that uh, Mr. Modestino made. Um, we've been working with the archdiocese on this property for the better part of three years, knowing that, that, um, <clears throat> that there was a closure coming to the archdiocese. So we've been working closely with them. Uh, being a resident in Braintree and, and a local developer, I've, I, I see this as a great opportunity for, for the town and a local developer to, to actually open up dialogue. Right now what we have is we have a piece of land which has specific zoning. I would argue that the zoning, residence B, is probably the worst type of uh, zoning for this development. Just from a, you know, if, if you're building single family homes, knowing the, you know, knowing the financial troubles that the town of Braintree and other towns are having, I think this is an opportunity for us to, to, maxim to do what was, um, you know, uh, with the master plan, we spent, you know, several hundred thousand dollars on creating a master plan. We spent several years uh, implementing that, we we know what that looks like. I, I I would say, if I were tasked with somebody handing me a copy of the master plan, which the t was created townwide, and asked to design a project, I think that's before you this evening. Now I'm not, you know, there's there's been a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, if I get a zoning change, how many units will I do? I think, I think that. We've spent a lot of time, effort. We know what we what we see to be appropriate for this land, and I think 48 townhouses at 55 age restricted is totally appropriate. Um, and I, I think it does a lot of things. We're, we're preserving a lot of the open space. That's one of the big things that were were discussed in the uh, in the master plan. There's not a lot of opportunity to preserve open space. We're we're a, you know we're an old town, uh, so land area is a premium. So I'd say, you know, I'd encourage the community and the various boards to take a hard look at what we have before us, which I find to be an absolute amazing opportunity to have such a large parcel. So I think it's in everybody's interest to move this forward so that we can continue discussion. Without a zoning change, we wouldn't be here this evening. We, we wouldn't be having the discussions that we've had with the neighbors. The neighbors wouldn't have an opportunity to really voice their concerns. So while I understand change is difficult, I certainly see that, but I, I hope that they also recognize that without this process, they do not have a voice. And sometimes folks don't, you, they get locked on certain things. Traffic, traffic is a very real issue, not just here in Braintree, it's, through, it's throughout the Commonwealth. Um, we know that a lot of the traffic that we see in these neighborhoods are cut through traffic. Um, 
as part of a zoning change, I think we're going to have the opportunity as a community to have a discussion. We're going to have traffic consultants, and we're going to mitigate that as best as we can. A lot of what's going on in the immediate area, um, there's a project right down the street that just offered up substantial mitigation to that same intersection. I think we can piggyback on that, but I just think we're, you know, we're willing to take a shot, and there is risk for us. I think one thing is, that is notable is with the zoning change, we lose our right to a 15,000 square foot lot sent for a single family, and we increase that to a one acre lot. So we are making a concession by having the zone and change as well. Um, I'm hopeful that we can move this board to some conclusion on this. Um, our intentions, you know, we do have, we do have um, and there's no secret to it, we have pending offers from, uh, from an assisted living, we have daycare, we have other multiple users. We've, we'd, we'd rather not exercise that because I think this is a great opportunity, but we do need to make some decisions and make them soon. Um, it may seem hasty on my part or that I'm pushing very aggressively, but I've given the community the benefit of Varying, uh, varying plans over since January of 23. We've had numerous discussions with all the residents in public forums and door knocking campaign that I held myself. So I know that some residents have concerns, um, but I think the way to solve those concerns is through this process. So I, I hope that you'll support us in this venture. Thank you. Comments for Mr. Modestino or Mr. Clemens from councilors? Mr. Moran. Attorney Mike, can you just clarify something? You began, I know the petitioners, the archdiocese, do you represent them as well as Mr. Clements? Well, the owner has to sign the petition, so we, we had to ask them to sign it. Uh, I mean, I'm not representing them per se, but for purposes of the application, they, they had to sign it. I've had very little contact with them throughout this process yeah. other than getting them to sign it. Yeah, it's been a concern of mine that they've been absent in this process comparatively to other communities where they're involved. And, yeah. um, and I would take note, you have noted that this is not tax producing property at this time. When the archdiocese relegates a property for profane use, which they did when they closed this on De in December of 2022, the exemption under chapter, under clause three and 11 of Mass General Laws chapter 59 expires sure. and they should be paying taxes right now. I understand. So I would uh, ask the clerk to note and that we forward correspondence to the mayor's office to ensure that this property is on the tax rolls. Okay, thank you. If um, I could just address one, one of your questions earlier. Um, we have a contract with the Archdiocese. In I'm going to ask about authorizes. that. I'm okay. going to ask about that. No, no, I thought you were asking if, if Mr. Modestino represented the Archdiocese. I guess he does in some form through the contract agreement that we have with the Archdiocese and their signature on the application, which permits Mr. Modestino and myself to represent their interest. Okay. Thank so you. there's a purchase and sales agreement between you and the Archdiocese? Mr. That is Clements? correct, yes. Okay, is it contingent on your part mm. about uh, that the zoning changes take Absolutely place? Absolutely no contingencies. It's we not. are closing on this property, and we're going to be moving forward in a, in a pretty uh, fast manner. Okay. But we, will, we are closing. We're not contingent buyers. We're buyers based on the land, so we're not contingent. Okay. Um, there's been some questions about whether or not to maintain the, uh, the building. And the building is, I think... A particularly, the church building is a particularly sensitive issue uh, for many people, including myself. I was baptized there. My brother was baptized there. My sister was baptized there. My parents chose to live on Worthington Circle when they moved to Braintree in 1954 because of St. Thomas More and the parochial church, uh, parochial school that, that was run there. Evidently, it was an attraction for a lot of other people because there were 53 kids in the classrooms when my... When my uh, sister started to attend and we went down the street to, the, to Lakeside School and that worked out pretty well and then we moved. Um, but it's a particularly sensitive uh, issue because it wasn't the Archdiocese that built this alone. The people that were part of the parish contributed to that and, then, and put their hearts and souls into the, into the building of the, of, of the church and the modifications that came subsequently. They changed it after the Latin Mass was changed, and then they changed it to a, 
a more of a, a rotunda feeling to it in later years. And, and so it's an expression of their faith that it was constructed. So there is a number of, there are a number of folks that would like to see it, see it remain. My concern, I'll, uh, one of my concerns is if you demolish it, there is the chance of hazardous materials going into the air and the, the remediation that will have to be done with any older structure being demolished. Have you had an assessment done of the asbestos levels in that building? We've, we went beyond an asbestos survey. We've, we've had a full environmental report, groundwater testing. There is no contamination. I actually have a strong background in the environmental field, so I'm very familiar with the regulations. Um, but I think to your earlier point, of course, it's a church. There's a lot of emotion involved. And thankfully, we're having this discussion so that if, in fact, we do the zoning change, we, there could be an opportunity for further discussion about preservation. However, without the zoning change, the church is definitely not um, there is no opportunity to preserve the church. So, so I think with, we're seeing some eye to eye on that. I think that good dialogue, which we're, which we're sharing with this community, is to that point. If we want to continue this discussion, this is how we do it. I appreciate your willingness to engage in dialogue. And, and um, you know, I, I want to compliment you on the fact that you've had neighborhood meetings um, to discuss your proposals. I think everyone would be more comfortable if, if we as a council, and we can't, would put some sort of restriction that would, would limit you to 55 and over as a use under residency. And the, 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 you know, the difficulty that, that we as a council have is you can make that representation, but once the zoning change is made, you're not held to it. Well, and so. I respect your work as a developer and mm -hmm. your commitment to the town. I think you did good work on Elm Street. I think you turn, you know, you, you did a good job on Cachado Club in, in that area, and you deserve credit for that. Thank you. Um, and I will tell you, I am, you know, I am not blind to the fact that something's going to be built here. I understand that. My role in this that I see it is to ensure that whatever happens is in the best interest of the town. And the more I can understand what exactly your commitments are and how hard and fast they are to limit the number of units that are being built and the use, um, you know, that would make me more um, supportive of a zoning change. But I'm going to need to see some definition and, and, some, and some, some commitment. So I think we are committed. I think we've committed a lot of time and resources to presenting you with this plan, presenting it to the community as well. But I'd ask the town give us that same. Um, we designed this based on a gift of land to the, to the town so that we're not, we're not trying to put affordable housing into this project. So we don't know, and we'd ask that the town, we have an inclusionary bylaw that was put forward to, this, to the town council two years ago with no action taken. So we don't know what, what the parameters of the town are going to impose into this project. And when, you know, I, I do appreciate your sentiments, but I think we're, you know, we're a brain tree developer. We've spent a lot of time, effort, and we've come up with many renditions of this. Our intent, and it's, it's kind of ironic, and, and I know this is in your ward, your district, if I will. Um, we propose the same 55 plus over where the CVS that I'm constructing currently is. That was pushed off. We also proposed it in another church location that was pr pushed off. Um, I think I've shown over the years a true dedication to 55 plus because I believe that it's a real need and I think it's a niche market that is, is, has real value. Um, if I were looking to skirt or trying to do a bigger project, there are other uh, venues available to me to do that. I wouldn't be taking the time here. So, so I think trusting in a local developer is prudent because I could be an out-of-state developer like many that come into a community and just come, don't, don't meet with you folks, don't meet with the community and just file their paperwork and supersede this process. So I think myself and my team have shown a real level of commitment and knowing that hopefully you'll work with us to go through it. Again, this evening we're not looking for a final vote. I think there's a lot more discussion that's gonna be had through the process. This is simply something that says 
<laughs> we believe that you're on the right track, let's continue the process forward. Even if we get the zoning change, we still have many layers through planning board and potentially zoning board. But it does allow that dialogue that we all look for. Okay. Um, as far as the five acres go, you know, you've emphasized a lot about uh, uh, in your presentation about the town's uh, current financial situation. And if you take five acres off the tax rolls and, and dedicate it to open space or give it to the town, it's off the tax rolls. I'd rather tax it and have a conservation restriction on it. So you'd pay less taxes than if you were using it for a residential use. You'd preserve it for conservation, but it's at least we'd be getting some revenue as, as opposed to none if we take it. Um, and just in closing, what my frustration is again is that the archdiocese is the petitioner. The archdiocese, the archdiocese didn't engage, to my knowledge, on this property in a request for proposals on it that would have, could have restricted it for a 55 or over um, development, could have restri requested responses for a 55 over development, and they didn't do it. Um, I think they've, they've uh, let the community down as far as I'm concerned in their inaction on this property. I don't think, I don't think you should be carrying you know, you should be bearing the burden for them that they, sh they should rightfully be forwarding as the petitioner on this. Mr. Clements, I don't mean to put you in a difficult position for this, but I am frustrated with the Archdiocese as I was in a previous community on the way that they disposed on their property. And I, I don't see them as good partners, and so I, am, I enter into this as, as skeptical uh, I am doing what I can to be open-minded in dealing with your, your proposal. I know your track record. I have a far greater level of trust for you than I do for the Archdiocese in this. So thank you for indulging me with your questions, or with uh, indulging me with my questions, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm just thank gonna you. ask for one pause if you wanna say anything, and I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Ringus. Good evening, all. Thank you for being here tonight. My sincerest apologies. I had a child care issue that became a Route 93 traffic issue, um, but I am here now. Um, so I do appreciate everyone being here tonight. I know that Mr. Clements has begun his presentation. I know that uh, Council Morin has just asked some questions. So with that said, are there any further questions uh, for Mr. Clements at this time? No, we're good all the people. Okay. Um, Mr. Clements, uh, with that said, anything further you or Attorney Monestino would like to add at this point? I think I'd like to, to allow the general public as much time as they need to, to express their concerns, but I'm happy to, you know, to continue the, the conversation after the residents and answer any questions that may come up as part of that. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Uh, with that said, I, I have no further questions at this time, but I would, there, there's a, a chance that we could call you back up to answer some questions. So Fair thank enough. you for your time thank tonight. You. Thank you. So to the residents who are here tonight, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, so generally, uh, I don't want to be redundant or repetitive, um, but uh, at the ONR meeting here tonight, we are obviously here to look at the possibility of rezoning a particular parcel, that being the current St. Thomas More Church and the land around and behind it. Um, I know that this is an issue that has generated um, some controversy, um, I think some strong opinions, um, and definitely a passion uh, from the folks in the neighborhood, um, as well as the folks who have attended St. Thomas More and that has been their you know, community parish for so many years. Um, the general way that this will proceed, just so we know, is obviously we have received a recommendation from the planning board. This will at some point end up before the full council. The uh, Ordinance and Rules Committee, anytime there's a zoning change that is proposed, um, we do hear uh, from those proposing it, and ultimately we'll make some sort of recommendation, whether that be favorable or unfavorable, to the full council. And the full council will uh, take this up 
um, which will be the ultimate decider of whether or not the zoning change goes through. Um, when it gets before the full council, there will be a uh, mandatory public hearing where residents will be able to address the council. The way that I've run ONR for the years that I've been chair is when we have issues like this, I think it's incumbent upon us to hear from residents um, as often as possible. Um, and so I generally open up ONR for public comment as well. And I, I know as Councilor Hume has indicated to you when she was sort of sitting in the chair for me, um, we are going to allow public comment tonight because I think it is important to hear from the residents. Um, there was a sign up sheet uh, and some folks put their name on it. So I will call folks up to the podium um, according to how they signed in. Uh, folks will have four minutes. Um, this will not be a, a dialogue, a back and forth, an answering of questions. This will be a, a, a chance for you to make a statement about your feelings or opinions on this project, whether you are pro-project, anti-project, uh, and the reasons for that. Um, again, it's a very passionate issue, and I understand that. So tonight is not the night for, for personal attacks. It's not the night for, for disrespect. I think it's a, it's a night for healthy expression of how we feel about this proposed project. Uh, and so with that said, um, I would, when you come to the, the podium, I'd ask that you introduce yourself, even though I'm gonna call your name, just introduce yourself for the record um, and your current address. So I will start with uh, Ms. Bobak. Hi, I'm Jean O'Brien Bovac. I live at 153 Park Street. I've lived there for 39 years. I'm in a butter to the church. Um, I have a point of information. If Mr. Clements said there are no contingencies on the purchase of the property, how hasn't, why hasn't the sale closed? Is that something that somebody can answer or not? So now, today, again, tonight's not gonna be questions. Tonight is just expressing your statements on how All right. you feel. Um, I also am curious if there's a fine that can go to the church for not having paid the taxes once the church was declared profane. Um, I have an issue with Ms. Santucci. She, this, in my opinion, the 338 Elm Street is one lot of land owned by one owner, and Ms. Santucci wants to keep referring to it as a tract to, because it's a big lot. Um, I don't think that's relevant. It's one lot of land owned by one owner, this one lot of land is surrounded on all sides by single-family homes. This neighborhood is one of the oldest in Braintree. I don't think Braintree's gonna have a lot of opportunity to build more single-family homes. It's all gonna be multi-developments, the MBTA development. I am adamantly opposed to changing the zoning. Mr. Clements stated at the, at the planning board meeting that if the zoning isn't changed, he's fine with going forward. So don't change the zoning. Because in my opinion, changing the... Changing the zoning is dangerous and risky because the town has no legal ability to hold the developer to anything. So if you change the zoning to see an 87 unit apartment building can go up by right. I, 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 I'm not comfortable with that. And especially when Mr. Mr. Clements said that he was okay with building it without a zoning change at the board, planning board, I see no reason to change it. I don't see any public good. I think um, 48 townhouses with two cars per unit would be 96 more cars every day. 26 homes with two cars per home is 52 cars. That's a big difference. Um, so my main issue, uh, the other issue I have is there hasn't been a lot of talk about what they're going to do with the church, which is a separate lot. So if they're going to make it a daycare or an assisted living, why do they need to change that zone, that property lot, too? Like, I don't see the, the need. Um, the other, at, the, at the planning board hearing, about 15 people got up and spoke, and the majority of the people spoke against changing the zoning. And then the planning board gave a positive recommendation, so it was kind of disappointing as a citizen to go out and spend my time and, and not be heard. Um, I think that there's plenty of opportunity in the MBTA zoned area in Braintree now for dense housing and multi-units, and I just do not want the zoning changed. I don't want this to affect my neighborhood that I'm gonna have townhouses and multi-unit dwellings. This is a very old, I think it's the second oldest residential neighborhood in Braintree. It's a beautiful neighborhood. 
and I am pleading with you to not change the zoning, especially in light of the fact that Mr. Clement said he's fine with developing it as B. And my other point is, I'm probably going to run out of time, but I know that based mathematically on the square footage of the land, you could put 26 houses. But realistically, with the wetlands, the drainage ditch, the topography, I don't think you could put 26 houses there. And also, I have another question, which I don't know who can answer it. The paper streets that they've talked about, if it stays res B, they're talking about opening paper streets that are there. Does anybody know, like, would these paper streets meet today's road width restrictions? Because I personally think they're cow paths, and you couldn't really open the paper streets because they're not going to be wide enough to meet the present requirements. Do you know what the road width requirement is? That's hard to say, road width requirement. So, Ms. Bobak, you've reached your four minute uh, limit. You, so, again, it's not going to be a dialogue or question and answer tonight. It's just going to be statements. Who would, know, who would I ask? We, we will bring that up, we will bring that up for the full you. council and you can email us as well. I would turn to Nancy Kennedy. Say Nancy Kennedy, 119 Blanchard Boulevard. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Clements, when I first met you at the very first meeting, I was not a fan of you. But you know what? We've had some discussions, and I am a fan uh, of you. We're not going to talk from the crowd. We'll let the speaker have and their I time. I am a fan of you. I think we've oh, had good discussions. Oh, you speak a little louder? She just can't hear you. I'm sorry. I think we've had good discussions, and we've bantered a little back and forth, and I have nothing against you. I've seen some of your work. I think it's great. If you change it to a zone C, and we have no commitments on what it's going to be. God forbid you get hit by a bus tomorrow and someone else gets it. What am I going to get? I'm serious. I'm serious. What's going to happen? We're going to have, we're going to have big buildings. That's what we're going to have. It's a zone C across the street. I get it. We can't even fill Danny's cleaners. Nobody wants that. The traffic you did, the, climb, the uh, Cachado Club, those are gorgeous. You can't get in and out of there. There's so much traffic. That's not your fault. That's not your fault. Messina Woods Drive is beautiful. Wouldn't that be nice going up and down those streets with all the, the trees in the middle? That would be beautiful. I would love it. I'm mad at the church. I'm very mad. My mother was a housekeeper at the church. I'm very mad, so thank you for saying that. They have done us a terrible disservice by not doing it right. Um, the average family now does not have four, five kids. They have one, maybe two kids, possibly three. Nobody, nobody can afford it. So they don't have a lot of kids that are going to be coming in and out. I'm 66. I'm going to be 67. Over 55, everybody drives. I'm 66, 67. I still drive. We all drive. So those are the cars. It's going to be a while before those kids get a little bit older, whoever's moving in there with small children. It's not, if you have 26 homes times two kids, it's not a big financial strain on the school system, I don't think, because the school's everywhere. Um, you started out in the very first meeting with houses versus condos. I don't know what changed. I don't know what changed, why now it's assisted living, why it's daycare center. I don't understand what's living. I, I'm okay with over 55. I couldn't afford the over 55 if I sold my house, and I have a nice home. It would be a lateral move, and I couldn't afford the monthly fees. I know I couldn't. So it's not like I'm going to uh, brain tree residents unless they're really rich. God bless them if they are. Um, we're I like a town. We're becoming a city with all these big buildings, all these condos. When I was a kid, I lived on the wrong side of town, which is East Braintree. We talked about it. It's now North Braintree. Skyline Drive, you had to be rich to live there. They were beautiful apartments. Now, their condos, their trouble. If this turns into a condos, God forbid you get hit by a bus, and it turns into condos or apartment buildings, you have the highway on Union Street, you got the highway on St. Clara's area. That's an easy on and off for everybody, just like it is down the plaza. We're just, we're a mess here. We're a mess. You know what? My kids live in this neighborhood. They bought homes in this neighborhood. My nephew bought a home in the neighborhood. We watch out for each other's kids. You saw my letters. I sent them all to you. I don't have to go over that again. These people, they don't care. Not that they don't care, but they have the same feelings, a lot of them, than me. I want to walk the dog. I want to walk my grandson. I want to walk the neighborhood. I, I, 
I just, and nothing against you. You're, I, you're a nice guy. You are, and I'm really nothing against you. And you want to make money, go for it. I want to make money too, we all do. And God bless you. And I don't think you're against the town either. I just think this isn't appropriate for our neighborhood. I also mentioned the Elm Street, um, Elm Lawn Road extension. Take a walk down there, it's beautiful. That was um, Elmquist. Get about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm all done. I told okay. you I wasn't gonna make the four <laughs> minutes, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Miss Page. Uh, Mr. DePaulo Jr. Just state your name and your uh, address. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Rick, but uh, Richard officially. Uh, DePaulo Jr. live at 311 Union Street in Braintree. Welcome. Uh, I'm not in a butter, but I am a, a opposed to um, and I do I do like um, the applicant. I, I have talked to him, but I'm opposed to um, multifamily uh, housing. I'm, I've always been. And, uh, and uh, uh, no one can make multifamily housing to meet what I would like for it. It's never happened. So I, uh, not the applicant, but I don't like it because what happens is uh, take a home that was built, say, 100 or 200 years ago or whatever. The, 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 our housing stock is nearing 100 for a lot of houses in Branch Room, maybe a quarter or two-thirds of the town. If you went... Look at South Boston. If you went originally and said the engineer in South Boston says you only got this much room, way back when he made those homes. And now time goes by and people have a new invention called the dishwasher. Or they got a new invention called piping that's not expensive cast iron so we can have a second bathroom. And all that other stuff that you never thought of. There's no room to expand. Now when you come up with the multifamily housing, they have a firewall, another firewall on the um, townhouses, the townhouses in the middle. And he's locked in to maintaining that property. That property, the best that property is ever going to be, is when it originally opens as a new property. Other than that, it will be maintained, but it can never be enlarged with an addition or anything without going through a lot of hard work, getting so many people's approval, including everybody in the condominium or in the townhouse, whereas in single-family dwellings, and I do believe Brantree has, is somewhat old. And, and uh, now, I, I believe that the property should remain residence B. I strongly believe that. And I also strongly believe that Brantree should look at large parcels when someone turns them over with a lot of acreage and not give them the traditional size lot that would have been in a neighborhood made back in the 1900s to squeeze everything in. When you get a big lot coming in and it's brand new and there's trees there and everything can be made enlarged, the house lots should be deep set back, vastly enlarged single family home house lots. And it, because then they have the potential to go out in time and retain value. If we came up with a new invention for the home, uh, we have solar lights, uh, solar panels going on the roofs and people want to have their own electric power at the home. They want to put an outside generator in each home. You need a little room. You need a little more room. And, and with multifamily, multi-dwelling, everything is set in concrete. There's no ability to expand or change things. Let me uh, give testimony to, if I may. Uh, I've noticed the people in the room, and um, uh, just to give testimony, I was, and uh, kindly the developer invited uh, um, in. I, I did the inspectional invitational uh, visitation tour. Uh, the director, um, Melissa, um, Ron Fraser from the Historic Committee, Kyle Johnson from the Historic Committee. I'm not from the committee. Uh, there's two other women, but I don't see anyone else in the room. I just wanted to let you know that the church, which is a separate parcel, but they kind of go hand in hand. The church, I, I inspected it. I went all through it. I went through the basement. I went up, I went up the side chutes. I could see the, the attic almost. I didn't want to go up the ladder to the attic. The, they, they have an extension ladder as high as the ceiling. Yeah, I didn't go up there. Went all through the building. And it is, as the applicant has stated, it's a well-maintained building. I don't want to say that because I know in the newspapers people think, well, we haven't had mass here for so many years, it's, it's dilapidated. No, it's not dilapidated. It's well-maintained. It's in great shape. You have about 15 and, uh, seconds left, Mr. DePaula. Uh, I, I missed what? 15 seconds. Oh, everything is in great shape. Uh, it, it's just like the, the applicant has stated. It's not dilapidated or anything. It's in good shape. It is separate, but it would be kind if the board could not render a decision and table it 
until we hear back from what the historic committee goes, because maybe keeping the two parcels together in some way will be divided and we won't be able to do that if we're not coordinating our response together somehow. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. DePaul. Uh, Mr. DaCosta. My name is Steve DaCosta, 70 Blanchard Boulevard, uh, and my land is looks at the, the woods for the St. Thomas More. So I see these woods, I thank God every day I have this little oasis uh, to be able to be, be in, involved with. I also have a, a paper street along one side of the house. So I'm, I'm kind of got both, both sides. I am 100% for uh, going to see, and I say that because when we bought the house 41 years ago, uh, I saw the woods, and it's like, okay, we have woods back here. Who owns it? What's going to happen to it? Is it going to end up being a nursing home or this big building behind me or something that has a lot of parking and traffic and all that kind of thing? Found out it was the churches eventually when they built a little trail. Uh, but for me, because of that, one of the worst things that could happen behind my house would be to have some kind of institutional building, uh, whether it's a, uh, you know, assisted living, independent living, nursing home, whatever it's called nowadays, um, to have that being built, because now you have a lot of traffic. It's not just cars in and out, it's employees, it's medical staff, it's uh, cars and trucks. To me, the, this is the best alternative that, that I could think of. Uh, to utilize the, the space, utilize a small footprint and allow a larger area of, of woods to stay there uh, so that we don't lose that, that uniqueness that that has in our neighborhood. Without those woods, it's just another bunch of houses there. So I think that gives more credence to the, the, uh, the neighborhood than if it were to end up being, if, if we can't go to a sea end up being a nursing home or whatever it ends up being. Um, and again, I apologize, maybe it's assisted living now. Um, so I am for 100% for that, and I believe what Mr. Clements says. Uh, he, he's been a straight shooter up to this point for us. I, I haven't heard anything that he has said that he's contradicted. Uh, the first meeting, uh, second meeting, everything has been consistent throughout. So um, yeah, he could get hit by a bus. I mean, I'm not going to go worst case scenarios, that could happen to any of us. But I'm, I trust that what he says he wants to do, that it is his goal, I truly believe that will take place. Thank you, Mr. Uh, DeCosta. Uh, Father Sean Connor. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Father Sean Connor. I live at 8 Hawthorne Road. Um, just understanding some of the communications of questions, I thought I'd come here and be able to answer them. But give you a little bit of the history. So this is the third mayoral administration that I've met with with the Archdiocese, with the development folks, looking at the vacant part of the property that was not in use. In fact, we've worked with Mr. Clements uh, for almost 10 years to find the best use of the property uh, until COVID hit and that, that kind of closed the church. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions for the board. I believe and trust in him. We've been very transparent for, with the three mayors, with Councilor Joe Reynolds, with uh, the town planner, uh, and there's no hidden agenda here, but we think this is the best use of the property. So thank you. Thank you, Father Sean. That is the end of my signed-in list, but I don't want to turn anyone away that would like to speak. Is there anyone that would like to be recognized at the podium who didn't sign up? Okay, seeing none. Um, I do have a letter slash email that I'm going to uh, read into the record. Uh, this is from uh, Joe Reynolds. Uh, who is a uh, District 2 resident and obviously the uh, District 2 counselor. Uh, counselor Reynolds uh, sends his apologies for not being able to be here tonight. He had an obligation, but he did want to address this issue. 
uh, Councillor Reynolds, or Mr. Reynolds writes, Dear Chairman Ringus, members of the Committee of Ordinance and Rules, I am unable to attend this evening's hearing on the committee's recommendation to the full town council concerning the rezoning of the St. Thomas More property located in my district. I respectfully ask that this letter be read into the record for this hearing. Thank you to all who have attended this meeting and who made me listening in on BCAM TV. I want to express my gratitude to all who have provided their comments and stated opinions on this important topic to the St. Thomas More neighborhood in District 2. I'll start my comments with addressing the what some who have said the town will have no enforceable definitive commitment as what we built on the St. Thomas More property before the potential zoning change. This statement is true. The town does not have any enforceable options to limit a property owner or requester of the zoning change to dictate what they will or will not build following said zoning change. This has been a fact for as long as zoning has been in effect in Massachusetts. What is not considered in this comment is that like any worthwhile negotiations between parties, here, Mr. Clements and the town of Braintree, there is the requirement of the parties to engage in a genuine and honest manner that will allow both sides to share concerns and to agree on what will be the best course of action. In this case, the future use of the St. Thomas More property for a mutually agreed upon outcome. To that point, I have been engaged with Mr. Clement, the Archdiocese, the Mayor's Office, the Planning Office, and most importantly, the neighborhood residents and constituents of District 2 since January of 2023. I see in the results of this engagement that all parties have agreed to the townhouse option as being the most balanced and beneficial option for all stakeholders in this equation. I will note also that there are some neighbors who do not agree with this outcome. I have taken a significant amount of time to study this issue, to weigh the potential options of what could be done with this site in the future and that would preserve the residential character of the area in question. I've also taken into consideration what impacts and or opportunities are possible in terms of following the spirit of the newly approved 2023 Town of Braintree's Master Plan, a project that contains the elements of preserving residential neighborhoods, a project that contains the ability to create residential opportunities for senior housing, along with ownership and financial equity, a project that actually increases town open space and will also act as a natural buffer between this site and the existing abutting homes. A project that will increase the diversity of housing options for our residents without disrupting our community's residential character. All of these examples are clearly a public benefit to our community. As for the comments from some that the town home project would create a tsunami of traffic problems, based on the various types of uses that have been mentioned over the last 14 months, the town home option would be the least disruptive from a traffic point of view. Some continue to cite the existing cut through traffic in Braintree and in many of our neighborhoods as a product of our own making. This is patently false. Study after study has shown that the biggest generator of traffic comes from commuters who reside in communities from various points south and west of our town and from large retail project. The data is available for anyone to look up for themselves. A single family subdivision of 20 to 26 homes, each with four to five bedrooms, would generate much more traffic than a 48 unit townhouse community restricted to owners who are the age of 55 or older not to mention the traffic issues generated during the school year. The residents be by right use of this building an assisted living facility and a child care center would also be a significant increase in local traffic. My point is that no matter what the future use of this site, there will be a certain level of vehicle trips associated with it. Lastly, I stand by my statements that the building of these high-end townhouses will most certainly raise the values of the homes in the abutting area. The homes in Hawthorne, Home Park, Blanchard, and Ulm Elm have varied levels of dollar value associated with them. With construction of individual townhomes that will fetch the estimated prices in the $700,000 range, I offer the following. When one averages the value of the abutting homes from all of the streets I mentioned, I can say that based on our town's assessed values of said homes, the sales trends, and limited housing inventory branches experience, all homes will reap the benefit of increased home value. As the district councilor for District 2, I put my heart and soul into representing and serving my community in the best possible manner. I always put in an honest effort. I trust in my experiences as a longtime planning board member, a homeowner, and a government leader in this town that those experiences have, have provided me with a high level of planning expertise and a high level of understanding insight of how many parts make up a decision such as we are facing today. 
I fully support the zoning change for this parcel of land, and I am fully confident that Mr. Clements will carry through on his commitment to construct the townhouses on the St. Thomas More property. Thank you for taking the time to hear my comments this evening. Joe Reynolds, District 2, Braintree Town Council. So those will be added to the record um, as the statement of District 2 Town Councilor Joe Reynolds. With that said, um, again, I would offer the opportunity for anyone who's not been recognized to approach the podium. Seeing none, are there any comments from councillors at this time? No. Okay. Um, at, based on the, what we have heard tonight, um, is there a favorable movement to uh, table this uh, to a date further uh, for a vote? I would move to table it to our uh, future meeting. I have a motion by Councillor Hume to table this to a future meeting. Second. I have a second from uh, Councillor Flaherty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So with that said, this has been tabled. The Town Council meeting on April 2nd, 2024 will not be a true public hearing that will have uh, testimony from the public. We will open the hearing um, on that night, but the testimony itself will be hold on the, held on the following Council meeting, which will be April 30th of 2024. So for those that do want to attend and offer testimony, that will be on April 30th of 2024. This board will meet one further time to render our vote um, favorably or unfavorably on the project. Um, with that said, I want to thank the presenters for being here tonight, Attorney Monestino for your representation, and Mr. Clements. I want to thank the residents for coming out tonight. I do want to thank BCAM for being able to televise this evening. It's one of the reasons we held it at this time and in this location so that BCAM could put this out to the general public. Um, with that said, I would also say to residents, if you were uncomfortable coming up, some people don't want to speak at a mic or in public, feel free to please continue to send emails to myself, uh, Clerk Semino, and any of the other counselors. Um, we do get them. We have received a large number, both supporting um, and not supporting uh, this project. So I look forward to further engagement from residents. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Council Hume. I have a second by Council Flaherty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous.